Good morning, and welcome to Moments with Melinda. I'm your host, Melinda Moulton, and today as my guest is I have Michael Couture. How are you, Michael? Good morning, Melinda. How are you doing? I am great. I am really glad that finally I get to have you on my show. I've been wanting to do this for a long time. Well, we talk a lot, but we don't talk on in this format. Yes, we do. Michael and I go back many, many years. Um, so let me tell my viewers a little bit about you, Michael. Um, Michael Couture has over 45 years in the media industry as co-founder and recording engineer producer for Earth Audio Techniques and Philo Records, and was a co-founder, senior editor, and creative director at Resolution, Inc., digital media specialist at Subatomic Digital, and presently is the owner of Michael Couture Media. Is there anything else you want to add to that long list of extraordinary? That is pertinent to my media background. Um, I also uh, work in the emergency department with substance use disorder. And we're going to talk about that, Michael. Okay. I want to get into that. But, you know, Michael, you're, you're, a, you're a Vermonter. You were, were you born and raised in Vermont? Grew up in Morrisville. Yep. And, so I uh, went to high school there. So I want you to talk, someone who, who's my age, you've lived in Vermont most of your life. Um, talk to us a little bit about what it was like growing up in Vermont in Morrisville, what your childhood was like. Well, it's, boy, it's such a different time. You know, we could, at, in, as toddlers, we could go outside and play and go to the neighbors and walk around town and it was safe and uh, just... Morrisville was a wonderful, self-contained town. Um, it had its problems just like every other town in the world. But um, I don't know. I felt safe there. You know, we had a good family core and um, we had animals, horses, and uh, just uh, small town stuff. So did you so so did you did you did your family have a farming background or no? I mean, there was farming in the back in the background, but my my dad was a pilot uh, in World War II, and um, he ran uh, the Union Carbide, which was. Uh, hey, Michael, hold on a minute. Let me just. Okay. Let me just. Okay. Sorry about that. Sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> okay, so continue on, Michael. So, Dad was the manager at Union Carbide, which was the record center for that company as uh, Morrisville was deemed one of the safest um, places in the country for, you know, archiving corporate records. And so he did that. Um, Mom stayed at home. Mom was originally from um, Greenwich, Connecticut, and she met my dad. He was a ski instructor at Stowe, and uh, she met him skiing. Moved to Morrisville, small town Morrisville, which I think was a a real challenge for a gal who was used to New York City and um, you know different different pace, different strata. Yeah, tell me about it. I um yeah I I, I totally I totally understand that. So um so then what what did you do after Morrisville? Where did you go to school? You went to UVM, right? I went to UVM. And um, I wanted to go to med school. And freshman year, uh, my mom passed away. And that sort of took the wind out of my sails for studying reasons. And uh, my grades started to fall apart. But I had to stay there because I didn't want to go to Vietnam. And, you know, I was lucky enough to garner a uh, higher number in the lottery. So I stayed in school, and halfway through school, my um, half-brother, Bill Schubert, and I started uh, Philo Records, and that was in 1970. Right. So I want to talk about that, but let's let's stick with – I want to go back for a couple, a couple of years. Is there, is there a person in your life who in particular inspired you to be the person that you are? Is there somebody who – who um who you can account for the successes that you've had? I think uh, you know I'm just thinking about this now because every time I ask I'm asked about a mentor and something a bunch of 
people come up, but n not one big one. But I think the the main pressure in my life um, relative to what I do is I have this daily pressure to create something artistically, photograph, paint, you know, video, whatever. And I don't feel whole unless I do it. And I think I got that from my mom, who whose dad was a very renowned artist and architect, and mom was a good artist as well. I think she shared that same daily pressure. And um, so, you know, following following the times, you know, media was changing rapidly while we were growing. And I just loved creating or solving creative issues with technology. And that leads me today. I mean, I every day I have to get out and do something that's creative. Well, you're very active and you are super creative. Um and back then, you know, technology and the computer and all that stuff was just starting. But you, when you went to UVM, uh, you majored in zoology and you minored in yeah. music. Um, so talk to me about choosing, because music, obviously, where you ended up is something that was, do you play an instrument? No. No. I mean, I, I play some keyboards, but, you know, I was in a band for a bunch of years in high school and college. And I was the lead singer. Um, but you, music is one of those creative entities that, you know, moves me. That you love. And and the businesses that you founded and ran focused a lot on that. Um, what about zoology? Was that? Um, that was the medical, you know, I, I and growing up with horses and, you know, I just love animals. I, I either wanted to go to med school or I wanted to go to vet school. And, you know, the challenge with animals, of course, is they can't tell you what's wrong. Right. So that's even bigger than humans. Yeah. Uh, but I think that's why, you know, animals and uh, just love them. Interesting choices. I think I thought it was so cool to learn that about you. So your love of music took you from 1969 to 2007 into the world of recording at Earth Audio Te Techniques, Philo Records and Resolution. I got to tell you. I just uh, interviewed Chaz Eller, and he told me that his experience at Philo Records, um, that you were his inspiration oh, for a lot of where he is today and, and his career and, and, and get him getting into recording himself. And it's it's on that that um, that interview that I did with CCTV, if you want to watch it. But he he um, he's a talented, talented creative person he is but he credits you for a lot of his success so talk to us about those companies that you started and you know you didn't you, you had a major role in them talk to us about that well the studio started out with bill schubert and you know, which one was that was that file that's, that's earth audio oh earth audio okay started yeah. out with bill that started out with Bill, you know, he was really interested in recording and I was interested in the performing part. And, you know, occasionally he would ask me, he'd have to go do something and he'd say, well, I got a group coming in, can you handle it? And so that um, evolved and we started getting a lot of national people coming through. Uh, you know, they would play at hunts and stuff and they would call us and stop by and say hi and and that's how we got this idea for file records. You know, if they're coming through here, why don't we record them and, you know, try to create a product? And that was the genesis of Philo. So explain that to my viewers. So you would record them. And, and I know there was a folk life kind of a folk um vibe to that as well at philo but you would record them and then would you put together back then it was albums right where you would create the albums yeah. or yep everything we everything. would hire the photographers we would do the photo covers we would do the copy we would record the music and um send the master tape out usually we would drive to montreal to master them and end up with the the disc that gets sent to the 
Presser, which was in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Which is my hometown. Yeah. And then, Who would have known? Uh, yeah. Wow, that's very so, cool. We have that connection. My heavens. So, um, and then from there, you, so what happened to Philo Records? Um, two things. One is it was the main reason was, is we weren't, we were undercapitalized. Actually, we weren't capitalized at all. <laughs> we were just, we were just, you know, a bunch of hippies that liked doing what we were doing. And we were, we didn't know anything about business and we just started doing stuff. And here's the problem. Here was the biggest problem. We had to buy our product and pay for it in 10 days. And we would send it to distributors around the country. And it was essentially a consignment business where they would buy a hundred albums of a particular artist and they would wait six months to sell as many as they could. And then they would pay us for what they sold maybe and send us the other records that weren't sold. And so, so we weren't capitalized to pay in 10 days and get paid in six months. That just is a, not a, that's a non-starter. Well, that's like self-publishing now today. Same thing happens is you've got to do consignment and give away 40% or sometimes 50% of the value of the book and you don't get paid until it gets sold. So that's, that's a exactly right. And, it, and we, just, make a living. we lasted for 12 years. Wow. And um, we did over 200 records and some of them are really still very popular. Some of the groups are still very popular. We're going, to talk, of, we're going to talk about that. I'm going to want to know, well, why don't we just do that right now? Um, talk to me about some of the great people that you, that you, um, that you recorded. It started out as, you know, singer songwriter, folky kind of stuff. It did evolve, but into other genres. But, um, you know, we started, I, th I think the first big artist that we did a record of is uh, Utah Phillips, who was a uh, really well-known songwriter and um, very political in the, in the IWW. And um, that moved us on to people like Rosalie Sorrells, uh, Dave Van Ronk, uh, Mary McCaslin, Jim Ringer, uh, Jay Unger. Oh, uh, geez, you know those are some big names. It's been a lot. It's been so a long helped, time. So you helped, you know, you helped their their careers uh, take yeah. off. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And and a few of them really did quite well. Um, the other thing that we did is we we became a major record company in Canada. We had a lot of Canadian artists, some of which, uh, in particular, a guy named uh, Jean Carignan, who was, he was a genius fiddler. I mean, like Heifetz genius. And um, so many people were after him, and I don't know why he came to us, but he came to us, and we did his records and I think he's one of the most we were the most proud of what he did and almost unknown in this country but a major artist in Canada wow. and we had uh, artists from um, Scotland Ireland England and uh, you know it was all sort of in the folky vein but yeah well things were folky back then that's true. So um, then you moved on to Resolution, which I remember used to do the tapes for 60 minutes. I mean, right. that company lasted a long time and did a lot of extraordinary work. Talk to us a little bit about Resolution. Sure. Um, Resolution was one of those. We, were, we had to change who we were every few years because of how fast business was moving. So we started out with a production arm and we were doing all of Gardenway's um, shows. We did 52 shows called The Joy of Gardening. Um, so there was that. And 
while we were doing that, Bill Schubert was kind of, um, and the marketing department were kind of envisioning a product for all of the cable networks, Food Network, A&E, Discovery, all of those, all the networks, including CBS, NBC, ABC, and PBS, um, of an idea of taking their shows and putting them on VHS and then, you know, selling them back to people who wanted an article or a show, like 60 Minutes, if you wanted to see one of those articles, you would, um, on the at the end of the show, you would see, you know, if, if you want a copy of this show, call this number or go to this address in South Burlington, Vermont. And that was resolution. And that was resolution. And we would take the master tape and take their artwork and um, make a number of tapes and and uh, send them back to you all the while, you know, taking your credit card and some of your information. And then we would uh, make sure that the client had that as well. It's outstanding. So. I mean, the company lasts for a long time. So um, I'm going to move on um, to, are you surprised by some of the amazing artists that have come out of Vermont? Fish, Grace Potter, Anna S. Mitchell, um, Shauna Taub, who just uh, finished her musical, um, um, Chuffs. I mean, are, are you are you surprised by the extraordinary talent over the years that has come out of Vermont? Not even a little bit. I I think Vermont is, especially musically, is one of the richest environments there is. I mean, even more than the, in a lot of ways, more than the New Yorks and LAs. That's where a lot of it happens. But this is the breeding ground for that creativity. And I will say that I hope this doesn't embarrass her, but I held... Anais Mitchell in my arms as an infant. Oh, oh, Michael, that's beautiful. She, uh, her, her mom uh, worked with my wife, and you know we, we became friends. So, have you seen Hades Town yet? I have not. Oh well, I saw it two weeks ago. I got to tell it to all my viewers. It's coming to the Flynn, actually. Hades Town. It's a must see. Anais Mitchell wrote it, produced it, uh, wrote the music. It's it's an extraordinary musical. You need to see it. It's coming to the Flynn. If you get to New York City, go see it on Broadway. It's a must. Um, so um, in 2010, you took a job with Subatomic Digital in Williston as a digital media specialist, and you worked there for seven years. What type of work were you doing during those years, Michael? Um, we would package. This was sort of a a, an offshoot of Resolution. Uh, the owner of the company was a former employee of mine at Resolution. And he started the company and sort of created a new niche, uh, primarily for the New York Times, which originally was a Resolution client. And we let this sp spin off to Subatomic Digital. But what I did was uh, I packaged programs for... Um, Apple, iTunes, for Hulu, for all of the uh, um, platforms that we all know and love today on TV, um, there, there was a very concise, special formulation of how to package not just the video and audio, but all of the uh, HTML that accompanied it. You know, the information that when you go onto a website is that's what you see. You know, if you go into IMDB, that's very similar. Um, so we had to package all that, make sure that there were no problems with the video. We had to format for every different platform, needed different specs. And so that's what we put together. Wow. And in 2007 <clears throat> to present day, you created... Michael Couture Media. So, and certainly, you know, that's where I sort of started to get involved with you in your work with uh, Rick. But so what types of services do you provide um, in your media company? Uh, primarily uh, audio and video editorial. 
but um, your husband, Rick, has shoehorned me into cinematography, which I, I never aspired to do. But You're very it, good at it. He, and he shoehorned me into a lot of things, let me tell you. I'm sure he has. Yeah. And vice versa, I might add. Yeah, but, probably. Probably. So um, while you're yeah. talking, so t- talk about some of the things that you do now that you're offering the public. Well, recently um, with Rick Moulton Productions, uh, the 75th uh, anniversary of fellowship with Mad River Glen. Um, we worked on a program for the Rokeby Museum. We are the biggest project that we worked together was um, an 84 minute piece on the um, amazing journalist, Lowell Thomas. And uh, that's been shown in, I think, 80% of the PBS markets. 93%, uh, I think it is. 93, yeah. Yeah. Um, that was an amazingly fun project um, because there was so much material. I mean, we did 84 minutes, and I bet we used not 10% of what was available. Yeah, pretty amazing. And, what a life. Um, um we're in the works, as you know, with uh, a, a project on Ethan Allen. And um, hopefully that's going to materialize soon. Um, so so I've been doing videos for, you know, primarily Rick Moulton Productions, but other, other people as well. Um, when I retired in uh, 19... Or 2016, I didn't know who I was anymore, and I had to reinvent myself. So I had to put myself out there, and uh, one of the things I found was photography. I wanted to get into that. So my next question uh, was because you're all, is you are an accomplished and noted photographer, um, and so what are your most favorite subjects, and how can my viewers see your work? And then I also want you to touch a little bit on you. You're also a painter. So touch a little bit on that, Michael. Sure. Those two things saved me because I got depressed. And um, the other thing that saved me, of course, is the emergency department. But um, photography, anyone, I don't know, almost anything catches me. I happen to be into birds and, and shooting my biggest challenge right now, this sounds very trivial, but it's not. And that is catching a butterfly on the wing in focus. Wow. And you know how they are. So, yeah, with a long lens, no doubt. So that's, you know, I go out to Colchester Pond and just wander around and and find these amazing moments in nature that just... Get me out of my own head for one and two, just make my heart sing. It's well, that- your, your work is beautiful. And the, the 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 photograph you did of the eclipse is flying off the shelves. I mean, that was a beautiful, beautiful f- photograph that you put together. Thank you. What, what about your painting? What's your medium in painting? Watercolor. I started well, with watercolor and uh, out of the ignorance uh, because it's so hard. It's And I say it's hard because... My graphic sense in video is in layers, and you can always put white over whatever you've got. And watercolor is the exact opposite. Your white is the paper. Right. So you have to really plan and think about it. So how do, how do my viewers see your, your work? Can you share with them your website where they can go My, to support? MichaelCouturemedia.com. Michael Couture media.com to all my viewers. All one word. Yep. Michael Couture, C-O-U-T-U-R-E. Media. Yeah. Yep. .com. Check it out, folks. So let's move on. Uh, I'm running out of, I could spend the whole afternoon with you, Michael. So talk to us about your work at the hospital, working in recovery, and also attending the Re- Recovery Coach Academy, the Vermont Association of Mental Health and Recovery. You were also a peer recovery coach for Turning Point Center in Burlington, and what inspired you to go into the field of addiction and recovery, which you are dedicated to, and you continue to serve all of those in need? Share a little bit about that, Michael. Uh, Recovery myself, my own recovery. Um, I uh, 
15 years ago, decided that I no longer wanted to use alcohol and stopped. And so I haven't had a drink in 15 years. And um, life has gotten better for me. I work in the emergency department as a recovery coach um, to pass it forward, to um, help people when they're in their lowest moments. And they are in the emergency department. Um, and, you know, with all this talk, Melinda, about uh, fentanyl and xylazine and all these crazy cartel drugs coming in, um, I've, our data shows that it's still 83% alcohol. Michael, I just wrote an essay for writing about our generation, and I'll send it to you on that exact subject. I'll send you my essay on that. I, I agree with you. And it's been 20 years for me, just so you know, my friend. Oh, yeah. But... No, no more dancing on pianos. Um, but no, my life has been was transformed. Um, thank you for the work that you do. Um, and um you're 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 at the hospital quite a quite a lot during the we're week. All, uh, there are seven of us and we're 24-7. Yeah, it's it's amazing. So Michael. Are you concerned? Um, and I'm going to go to to a to our split screen now. Um, are are you concerned for the future of humanity, with the specter of climate change, authoritarianism, and inequality rising around the world? Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Share with us some of your wisdom. Yes, I am concerned. Uh, mainly, what I'm concerned right now about is the 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 dichotomy in people's beliefs and how no one seems to want to listen to the other side. I mean, I look at Washington and it's it's a nightmare. It just feels like nothing is happening because people are so entrenched in their beliefs. And that scares me. I know it's a human trait, but it scares me. Um, what else scares me is just watch the weather and what's happening around the country, around the world right now. And we've known about this for decades. We knew it was coming. We know it's coming. And we're just, you know, we we won't solve it until it's a horror. And I believe it's a horror, a horror now. It's it's uh look at the floods, look at the storms, look at the what you know, the what the water levels rising. I mean, Miami's going to sink. So what do you tell your grandchildren? Because you're a grandfather. What do you tell your grandchildren about navigating this world they are growing up in? Good question. Um, I think they need to get a little older for me to have a conversation like this with them. But um, I'm going to always tell them that I have hope in them. And that, you know, they they're they're going to inherit some miserable stuff that we engendered and i believe that they can fix it yeah i have great hope in our youth i really do that call that came in was for my granddaughter who's looking to do some internship um at one of our great nonprofits in vermont well michael you know you're an old friend i want to remind you too that you i believe were you involved in the Aiken film? The film in Aiken on Aiken? You might have been. But you know, George, have been, right? but George yeah. Aiken was a governor of Vermont. He was also a senator. And those were the days when, you know, the two sides would go out to lunch. I mean, this is a recent phenomena where um in probably the last 15 years where our government can't work to solve problems. And um, I have great hope that it's going to change. Um, but climate change is, I, I believe, is our number one real issue in this in this world for the future of our humanity and our species so but you know, you know, I, I think one of the biggest problems in in uh washington is lobbies yeah, yeah and, and big money too i wish they could just make lobbies go away and let the guy the people that are you know creating laws do their jobs well you know i was at the uh sanders gathering last on friday friday a week ago and 
And Bill McKibben spoke and he said, you know, there's stuff going on on the good side of climate change that people don't know about. And and it's, you know, there's also the, the bad stuff, but people need to know that there's also great stuff around the corner. Um, so, you know, India is going all solar. There's some great stuff going on. So, Michael, you are always a delight for me. I consider you a brother. Um, you're one of the most talented human beings I know. That's Rick down there oh, saying so hello. Nice. Um, no, you really are. You're one of the most talented people I know. And I'm just glad to have been born into your sphere of light. And um, Same here. And I look forward to growing old with you, my friend. We already are, my dear. I don't know. We're not. We're not, Michael. We're still so young at heart. Well, I love you so much. And I wish you a beautiful day. And thank you for taking your time to talk to me and my viewers. I really appreciate it. And to my viewers, thank you for joining me and Michael. And I will see you soon. Have a beautiful day. Bye-bye.